in addition to our interviews, observations, and document analysis and looking at forms and reports, there are three contemporary methods that we can use. Um, so the contemporary methods that our textbook talks about are joint application development, uh, and then the next one is case tools, which we'll talk about, and then using system prototypes. So these are the three techniques that we can use in addition to those traditional methods. I think the traditional methods are great, uh, uh, you know, and they're going to give us a lot of information. And these are just some additional tools we have in the toolbox that we can use. Um, but let's talk about the JAD, Joint Application Design, first. And I mentioned it earlier. Basically, Joint Application Design is when we get a group of people together. Uh, you know, we talked about NGT before, right? So NGT is very similar, the, the uh, uh, normative group technique. Uh, this is kind of an extension of that, right? Um, so JAD has been around for a pretty long time, this concept. I'm sure most of you have heard of this concept of getting together as a big group. Um, it's been around, you know, IBM started this in the 1970s as a technique for uh, determining system requirements. And, and basically, you get into a room that looks like this. Everyone sits in a, you know, and faces each other in a nice meeting room. We might have a projector to project information on a screen. We're going to have whiteboards so we can whiteboard things. We're going to have an agenda. We're going to have, you know, somebody who's running that session. You know, some of the typical, typical participants you'll have is the session leader that organizes it and runs the session, keeps everyone on track and on target. You've got the users who are the people who are actively speaking and, uh, you know, actively participating in the session, managers who might be involved, sponsors who are going to be involved. Maybe there's the people that are going to use the system or the people that are, uh, you know, maybe, you know, people who are in charge of the company or they're a business unit or something like that. Uh, you'll have the systems analysts who are there to learn about what this, you know, we're the ones that are trying to, you know, to, to make this new system. So this is, we're there to kind of take notes and, and let them hash out how the system needs to work. Um, somebody's going to make sure that they record the session and distill everything that's discussed into, you know, main bullet points, right? So, um, you know, they're the ones that are responsible for capturing these requirements that come out of this meeting. And again, the whole point of the JAD meeting is to codify the requirements for the system. Uh, and of course, the IS staff is going to be there because, you know, this project will probably be thrust upon them, right? So they're going to want to know uh, what they're getting themselves into here. Um, the end result is that we should have some documentation that details the existing system. So now we know exactly how the system currently works. Uh, they're also going to tell us what would be helpful to have in the future. Um, so that's going to be the end result of JAD. So that's the basic concept of a joint application design session. Another, another tool that we have is uh, case tools. So case tools have uh, diagramming and form building uh, tools that we can use to try to understand the system. Um, so we could start to use case tools to, um, uh, to do a couple things. We can use it to reverse engineer existing system. So you can point it to a database, for example, and say, okay, everyone, this is the current database structure that we use for the system and use that to try to determine, you know, exactly, you know, what are, you know, the data that we have to keep track of in our new system or, you know, make sure we use that to capture an accurate analysis of how we currently use the system. Um, and we can also use case tools to start doing prototyping. Proto so a lot of case tools have uh, the necessary tool sets to let us start building a system that we can prototype and say, okay, would something like this work or would something like that work? And we can do that live in a meeting like this. So another, the last contemporary method would be prototyping. So prototyping is where we begin to actually build the system, right? So instead of designing the system, instead of doing our analysis first and then, you know, and, and then coming up with our design later on, or here's what the system requirements are, instead, we can just start trying to put something together and let the users play with it and see if this is kind of what they're looking for and see if this would work for them. Um, so, th so that's one way you could do this is prototyping. Prototyping works generally well when you have smaller systems or less complicated systems. Um, they don't, generally don't work well on huge or large projects because uh, it's difficult to prototype things like that. You spend a lot of, you know, you waste a lot of time doing that. Uh, but for sure, prototyping is another example. There's two types of prototyping. You have evolutionary prototyping where you start building this prototype and eventually it becomes the new system. Right, so that prototype that you're developing in this analysis phase is eventually going to convert into the actual system. And a lot of newer, you know, programming tools and case tools make this a lot easier. You can, you know, you can do this much easier than you could in the old days. The other type is throwaway prototyping, where we make this prototype, but we know it's not going to become the real system. This is just sort of a proof of concept to say, well, we can develop the system, 
but now let's let's scale it up by building a real system. Uh, so a lot of times these prototype systems, if in a large project, you won't be able to scale that prototype. So you can build the prototype as sort of a proof of concept and, and to refine your understanding of the requirements, but you're just going to throw it away and end up building a different system anyway using some different technology that's required. Um, so again, that's the other option. So we have evolutionary and throwaway prototyping. So it's most useful when uh, the user requests are not clear or there's very few users involved in the system. Uh, maybe it's a very small system. It's a very niche system, right? Prototyping can be useful. That evolutionary prototyping technique can be useful in that case. Uh, if you have uh, complex, um, complex requirements or the designs are complex, and it helps to see that prototype to understand how they're going to work in the real world. Uh, if there's a history of communication problems, in other words, the users say, that's not what I asked for. Uh, you know, a prototype gives them an opportunity to see it before you, you know, sink a lot of time and effort into the project. Um, and then it's also good if the tools are readily available to build the prototype. If you have the technology to build that prototype, uh, it certainly makes it a little bit easier. Some of the drawbacks of prototyping is uh, when we do that, we tend to avoid formal documentation because we've already built the system. Why bother documenting it, right? Uh, so that's one problem. Uh, it's difficult to adapt to a more general user audience. Uh, sharing data with other systems is often not considered in the prototyping technique. It's difficult to do those integrations with different systems. And going back to formal documentation, uh, a lot of times using prototyping bypasses the formal SDLC, which we're learning about in this course. And SDLC is a really good technique to make sure that we are designing systems that are useful and that are going to work and are going to meet some of the uh, engineering requirements that most people will need in a, in a real system. Um, so for sure, it's uh, you know something to look out for if you're going to do prototyping. But prototyping is definitely, there's a time and a place to use prototyping, and it definitely makes a lot of sense to use it in many, in many circumstances. One thing your book also talks about in this unit in requiring, uh, in determining, the determining requirements is kind of an odd place to bring it up. And your textbook talks about the, uh, business process reengineering or BPR. And this is where we are looking at existing processes and we're trying to, um, to see if there are better ways to do something. If we can completely redesign how a business works or how a process works. So a lot of times we end up with processes in sort of a de facto way. It's just the way they've been done, right? It's just the way that people do something. It just evolved a certain way. But maybe, you know, years after something has evolved a certain way, maybe there's new technology that's available that will, uh, that, that, that maybe would be a better way to do something. And maybe that's how we would have designed it from the beginning if that technology existed. Um, so that's what BPR is all about, or business process re-engineering. Um, so, uh, so identifying process to re-engineer, so any key business processes, structured, measured set of activities, uh, designed to produce specific output, a particular customer market, focused on customers or, uh, and or outcome, um, uh, some techniques is required, requirements determination are used, or the same techniques rather. Um, so activities that could, uh, uh, that could need radical change would be things like uh, you would look at the importance of the activity, the feasibility of making that change, the level of dysfunction of the current activity. And one thing your book does talk about with BPR is disruptive technologies sometimes enable uh, business process re-engineering. So disruptive technologies are new technologies that can radically improve some process. Um, so that's what disruptive technologies are. So that's another way to, uh, to approach business process re-engineering. You look at what these disruptive technologies are and see how you can apply it to, uh, to the problem that you're trying to solve. So requirements, there's also the Agile methodologies. Uh, so Agile methodologies is continual user involvement. So you, you very closely involve the user in your uh, design. You're doing very quick iterations through the SDLC when you're, uh, when you're using the Agile methodology. Um, so it's focused on the user's goals, their roles, and their tasks. Uh, the planning game is another example, which is used in extreme programming, and that's discussed in more t uh, detail in your textbook, but I'm not going to get into that too much here. Um, so again, that's the Agile methodology. Uh, usually it gathers a group of programmers, analysts, users, testers, and a facilitator in these quick uh, iterations, in these quick meetings. They document uh, complaints of the current system, then you determine some important user goals, uh, you prioritize them, describe the task for each role. 
you group similar tasks into interaction context, and then you associate the interaction context with the user interface for the system, and then you prototype the interaction context so that you can uh, uh, step through that process in your prototype, and then finally uh, develop your system. So that's how extreme programming and agile programming work. And I would say that you know after we talk about all these different requirements gathering techniques, in most cases, you're going to probably be using sort of a hybrid of many of these different techniques. You may have elements of agile and extreme programming, but you're also going to have the traditional methods like interviews and observations and so forth. So all of those things are going to be involved in this, uh, in this process. All right, so that's everything you need to know in this unit about requirements gathering. And again, the important takeaways here are we can do interviews, observations, uh, and we can look at business documents like forms, reports, and standard operating procedures to gather our requirements. And we're going to talk about these, uh, these deliverables from our requirements gathering again in the next unit when we talk about process analysis. We're going to start getting into how we, how we take all of this stuff that we gathered, these requirements, and we start to turn that into um, uh, some kind of model that demonstrates our understanding of the current system and our understanding of how a new system will need to be able to work. So again, we'll get to that in the next unit. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you for watching.